Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's also an honor to be here and talk about this. So I'm, I'm really happy about this. Um, I realized I should have added more Easter eggs in this lecture for, for Easter, but this didn't happen. One thing about AATN um, that, that might not be clear from the beginning, we could be more um, honest about this, it's free to join and free to stay. So like you just essentially you just sign up for an email list and we'll send you links to the talks and you can but you can also just watch the talks on YouTube anyway. So you have no the only benefit that you get is that we will send out emails early on and be like, hey, someone cool is giving a talk. Uh, please please consider joining. So other than that there's like no uh, requirements or in particular you don't have to do anything for, for us. So you just have to, to enjoy the show. Um, with that, let me start and see where the presenter works. We will check that. So, um, I, I want to first start to give an overview of machine learning. This is, of course, super relevant. This is a great comic called XKCD. If you don't know that, you should definitely read it. Um, so, machine learning, and this is still unfortunately uh, very much true. So, I used to be a mathematician. Well, I still am a mathematician, but I uh, started out in math, so I don't consider myself to be someone that really was born into the machine learning world. So I, I reserve the right to have a critical opinion of that. And this perfectly encompasses even the new uh, developments that we have. So basically, you pour data into a big pile, you do a lot of linear algebra, sometimes not, and then you collect the answers uh, uh, on, the, on the other side and look at this. And if they're wrong, then you just stir the data a little bit and you see what comes out. And that's, of course, not what you want to do, like you want to understand a little bit more what's going on under the hood, what's going on fundamentally. Uh, and give two examples in this talk of where topology can help elucidate some things about the data and also help you arrive at, at better results or at, at better answers, basically. So it's a it's a stirring um, of the of the data, but a stirring in in a proper direction. And for those of you that are not directly familiar with the with uh, machine learning, there are two camps currently um, in, in, our, in our land at least. Uh, there is this one camp, uh, oh, now I lost the pointer. Uh, it doesn't matter. The point, um, the camp uh, above is the statistical learning camp. So these people care about the VC dimension, for instance, of the data. They look at things like regularization, peer to risk minimization, and so on and so forth. And then there's the rather new neural networks crowd. And those people care a little bit more about just saying, okay, we stack more layers, we add more data, we add more GPU costs. Now, of course, this is a little bit unfair because the, the, the latter crowd here has much more empirical success, I should say. So all these things like ChatGPT and so on, they are all developed by, by exactly uh, this. But nevertheless, um, there, there is something to be said here that there is like a divide between the classical camp and the, uh, and the deep learning camp. But topology being very much neutral uh, can, can help in both cases. So um, I would say if you were to ask me for, for an honest definition or summary, I would say that Classical machine learning techniques, the things that you might read in books from, let's say, maybe 10 years ago, they are often somewhat better interpretable. Uh, they work well in the small sample regimes. If you don't have humongous amounts of data, then this works uh, well nicely. They have, in particular, low requirements on, on compute. So you can often run these things on your, on your own laptop and so on. You can still do that. Whereas deep learning is often, and I'm using an emphasis here because it's not always true, there are things like explainable machine learning, explainable AI, and so on, that open this black box a little bit. But for all intents and purposes, deep learning is still uh, like a black box in, in many cases, which also means that, that things like ChatGPT pose um, a problem for us in the sense that we need to understand what is going on behind the hood. If you're following this discussion, some people are saying that maybe there's consciousness in there, maybe there's not. Um, I find this discussion fascinating and also these questions are really hard to answer because you can always shoot back with the question well, what is consciousness anyway, right? So I, mean, I couldn't define it, but I think that I'm conscious, you might be conscious, I'm doing this in, in very cautious terms here, right? So it's, it's very, very complicated, but we really lack a fundamental understanding of our uh, ability as a species or, or as engineers to, to train these large deep learning models has far outpaced our ability to actually understand them. Uh, nevertheless, it's a cool technique. It, it, it can solve certain problems. It can uh, help address certain tasks. On the other hand, it also requires large amounts of data. So again, to stay a little bit, well, it's a little bit timely, so I guess most of the examples will be ChatGPT. Uh, these things are being trained by having hordes and hordes of people in other countries labeling data, looking at data, and so on and so forth. That's a really big societal issue as well. I'm definitely the wrong person to address this issue, and I really mean this. This is something that 
has to be done by policy makers and by, by ethicists and so on. But it really is true, it requires large amounts of data. So in, in my home institution, Helmholtz, we are doing um, healthcare research. And even though we have the, the technology to do large scale single cell sequencing and stuff like this, we also often sometimes lack these large amounts. So because it's very hard to get even 50 patients enrolled in a study from which you can then uh, gain, gain some information. And 50 is already a lot for many biological studies, but machine learning starts when you have thousands of them, right? Uh, also on top of that, we have high compute requirements. So basically, even though you cannot train certain models or at least apply certain models also on the laptop computer, the training is still something that is really complicated. Here again, we have some considerations that are way beyond my, my pay grade essentially, like the environmental concerns, the ecological concerns. Um, but they, they exist, people are using this, so I'm just pointing it out. One thing that I, uh, that I do want to mention, maybe for you as a take home message from this slide, is that these classical models, they sometimes lack a little bit the ease of trainability, because you need to think a little bit about handcrafting your features. You need to think about, okay, this is what I measure, this is what I put in there, and so on. Whereas, Deep learning models, they tend to pick up features that might be relevant for the task at hand, but then of course you, you pay the price in the investigation uh, a posteriori. Of course, if you're only interested in having a good accuracy for whatever task you want, then this, is, then this is not an issue per se, but if you want to understand how a certain diagnosis, for instance, or prognosis, or treatment recommendation, or things like this has been reached, then it gets, gets interesting. Now, a little bit of a sharp cut here, and uh, a spoiler, so topology also doesn't solve these problems yet, right? So I'm not, I, I cannot tackle any of these problems here on the right hand side in, in this small lecture. What I can do, however, is I can give you a glimpse at what topological data analysis can do when combined with machine learning and how it can improve and expand on uh, existing machine learning models. And since some of you are here and this is being recorded, uh, the people that are here actually have the have the opportunity to also steer this talk a little bit because um, I think all of you have probably a different exposure to machine learning and it might very well be that I might be going too fast for certain things now later on. So you interrupt me then please and I'll uh, just uh, zoom in a little bit and give more details. Now um, <coughs> this actually brings me to my first point, sorry. Um, this is the usual pipeline that you will find in topological data analysis. And I think you've covered all the basics for this already, as far as I understand. We start with a point cloud. You do persistent homology, which to me is a little bit like a coffee grinder because it refines your data. So you can't drink coffee beans, but if you run through the grind and add some other ingredients, you can actually get something nice out of that. That's great. You get the persistence diagrams or some other descriptors. We're not going to talk at length about this, but I want to mention that the diagrams are not the only descriptors that you, that you can do. In certain applications, other descriptors might be more uh, appropriate. And then you add the machine learning. You basically throw them in the machine learning pipeline. This is a little bit unfortunate because it, because it shortens and compresses the role of topology into yet another way of generating features for machine learning, which is why I'm interested in this red arrow here, and I realized that this is very hard to see, but the last arrow from persistence diagrams to machine learning, I highlighted this in red because this is the part that I care about. I ideally want this arrow to go in both directions, so to make machine learning also inform the calculation of topological features, uh, and not only to have the topological features as like one static snapshot of a data set and then, uh, and, and then throw them in the, in the pile of linear algebra that I showed you at the beginning of the slides. And indeed, just to give you a couple of of um, ideas and a couple of references. This is where people have been spending some time in, in developing new concepts. So for instance, there's the work by Pulina and colleagues on topological function optimization uh, for continuous shape matching. There's work by my colleagues and myself on topological autoencoders, which is also one of the papers that we'll be discussing today. And there's work by um, Kajia and colleagues on optimizing persistent homology based functions. And I'm pointing this out because this is really fascinating because it, it, it shows that you can actually do this, this last arrow here in both directions. You can optimize the persistence diagram calculation such that you solve a certain task in the episode, such that you get persistence diagrams that are particularly suitable for maybe a classification of a task or something like this. And you can basically back propagate information through 
the persistent homology calculation. This is a really big find, it's a really big thing that is happening in the, in the community now because it means that fundamentally, even though persistent homology is a rather, I would say, discrete technique, right? You start with your, with your points, you start to grow your, your complexes, you calculate the, the, the persistence uh, of, of individual features. This is a very discrete process, but nevertheless, it can be nicely integrated with machine learning models in uh, general. This is what we'll be looking at now for the, for the rest of this lecture. So we're going to start with a very nice uh, topic, namely the point on representation learning. So this is um, this should be exactly aligned with, with how you how you learn about, about persistent homology, I hope. So you start with a pointer and you want to you want to learn something of, uh, from it. Although I'm adding, of course, a little bit of a, of a machine learning twist, namely this point of using high dimensional space. So you can't directly visualize it, and you can't directly work with it. So what do you do? Well, you train a machine learning model to learn a lower dimensional representation. Now, maybe a quick show of hands or running or whatever sign you find appropriate. Um, who of you has heard of autoencoders before? Oh, okay, this is a good crowd. Okay, so, so then, then, then this is not uh, too, then it's okay if I just summarize this very, very quickly. So basically, you take high dimensional data set, you have this bottleneck representation in the middle. This is where you can see that the, when the network gets a little bit smaller, of course, it's just an illustration. In reality, these things are a little bit more deep and more complicated. This is known as a latent representation. And then later on, you uh, reconstruct uh, the data uh, again. The idea is that you basically learn an identity function, but an identity function with a twist, namely with a twist that you that you consciously uh, remove uh, certain features or consciously remove some kind of um, some kind of capacity. And typically, of course, this, this big dimension, the input data dimension, is way uh, higher than than the intrinsic dimension or the data representation dimension because you want to learn a low dimension embedding. And all of this works by having a nice loss function that measures essentially quality of your reconstruction. So you compare your input point out x and your output point out x tilde. And if this if this loss is low, then you say, okay, I found a good reconstruction. Now, people are using this in particular in, in my application domain, I would say, for, for healthcare analysis, people are throwing these single cell data sets into such a framework and they're you know, calculating low dimensional representations in order to reason about certain cells and how they are behaving, how they are related with pathologies <coughs> and cancer. And indeed, autoencoders are really nice because of, because of that reason. The, these middle layers, they serve as, as the so-called bottleneck later representation, and they are used for all kinds of interesting uh, uh, applications, uh, such as visualization, so making sense of a data set, in interpolation, so you can use the latent space to, to look at what happens between two samples that you've measured and let the autoencoder reconstruct a new sample from that, or you can just do clustering and figure out what is going on in the data set, so figuring out which groups exist in your uh, space. So it's, a, it's, it's an active research field. There are countless architectures, and it's uh, almost impossible to name them, uh, to name them all within, uh, within one, uh, within one uh, talk, so I'm not, I'm not going to try this, but I'm going to show you how we can make this a little bit topological. So uh, this work with, uh, uh, with Michael and Max and Karsten. Um, so Michael is now uh, doing a postdoc uh, with Jurelaskovic. Max is uh, working at Amazon Research, and Karsten uh, has its own research group. Uh, again, he already had one at the SSD, but now he has one at the FBI, so he's an FBI director also in Munich. But we are not directly affiliated, so just, just to clarify. But this was done during my posting. This was a really nice uh, work where we were basically looking at the latent space that is learned by, the watch, uh, by a normal autoencoder. And we were motivated by the observation that people tend to use the latent space, so this middle representation, to do all kinds of inferences from their data. So to say, we have these groups in there, we have these clusters in there, we have these sort of structures, these sort of shapes in there, and so on and so forth. But what they never looked at is whether this latent space is actually representative of topological information or of geometrical information in the input data. Because that's not necessarily a given. I mean, you're only forcing the autoencoder to give you back a nice reconstruction. Technically, the autoencoder has any way of, of choosing a, a latent space that is appropriate for a task, and it might not be what you, what you want it to be in, in terms of the, of the 
intuition or in terms of the, the distances from us that are being represented here. So that was our motivation. We wanted to imbue the autoencoder with more knowledge about the topology of the data. And we wanted to make sure that certain topological features, topological structures are being preserved. Now, how did we do this? We essentially branched out the pipeline and uh, made, our, made our own uh, little uh, training update to this autoencoder. So on the top half of this picture, you can see the usual training procedure at some sense. So you have the input data x, you have the reconstruction x tilde, and then you have a reconstruction loss. You evaluate that reconstruction loss while training your machine learning model with your data, and then you adjust the weights of the neural network accordingly so that this reconstruction loss is being lowered. And this is essentially what, we're, what all the autoencoder models have in common. Some are a little more complicated. They variational autoencoders, for example, they have a probabilistic loss term in which you solve with some kind of approximation and so on. But this is normally what you want to do. What we now did is we said, well, we want to have a good latent representation, a good latent code uh, of the, of the autoencoder. So what we did is we calculated persistence diagrams, which are always shown schematically here, of course, calculated persistence diagrams of the input data and of the latent representation. And then we derive the topological loss from that. So essentially, we force the autoencoder to learn a latent space that preserves as much of the topological information in the data as possible. And this works interestingly because the persistence diagrams, of course, they, you can't calculate them in, in arbitrary dimensions, of course. But even though you have, a, let's say, a 10-dimensional space in as your input and a two-dimensional space as your, as your representation, you can still match the persistence diagrams in, in some of the lower dimensions. So you can still enforce some kind of topological and geometrical information, of course, to be present there. This is kind of the idea of the topological loss. We were able to show that this kind of formulation is differentiable under certain conditions. I won't bore you with some of the details, but the, the main condition that we found that, that is relevant here is we have to assume that the points are in general positions so that we don't have uh, non-unique uh, distances in our data set. And with real-world data, this is almost a given anyway. So, so this was not this was a very, very mild condition on this. And then we were really surprised to see that it literally just works. So you can really see that it pulls together um, your, your information and it, it starts integrating some topological of the data. I'll show some examples uh, in a few minutes. But before that, I want to uh, zoom quickly out and want to give you some theoretical notion based on work by Fetcher Zahn and others, why this actually works in theory. Because one of the biggest issues that I always have to struggle with when doing machine learning and topology is that machine learning tends to happen on the level of mini batches, on the level of subsamples of your data. So you never, you almost never, cautious here, this is being recorded, you almost never learn on the full data set. So what you do is you take your data set, you subsample it into smaller batches, and then you have a subset of a certain cardinality, I don't know, 256, 1024. Uh, we computer scientists slash mathematicians, we have a pension for these powers of two, but you could take something else instead. Um, anyway, and then you learn on these batches. And this is, of course, interesting because we tend to think of TDA as something that takes your full point cloud, gives you more representation than you've done. So the first thing we had to overcome, or at least think a little bit about, is what actually happens when we go to the self machine. And uh, thanks to some great theorems by Fletcher and others, we were able to show that we can essentially bound the probability of our persistence diagrams exceeding a certain threshold in terms of the bottleneck distance. Mini side note here, uh, bottleneck distance is one way to measure the distance between uh, between persistent cycles. I think you haven't covered this in the lecture yet, right? Okay, so I'm sorry, I won't, I won't give a formula for this, but it, it involves basically seeing how easy it is to transport all the, the points from one persistent cycle to, to the other persistent cycle. So it solves an optimal transport or optimal matching problem of the persistence diagrams. Um, the exact details actually also don't matter so much. It's, it's just one metric to compare persistence diagrams with each other. And we were able to show that this metric can be, can essentially be bounded by um, another metric, by the Hausdorff distance, or rather in this case, there's a probabilistic theorem, uh, the probability of the Hausdorff distance exceeding a certain threshold. So in some sense, what this theorem tells us is that our mini batches, so these subsamples that we have in our data set, they are topologically similar, 
if our subsampling is not too coarse. And that is good news because that means that essentially, unless we have really weird, wild data, we can essentially always use this, this approach and we can derive some information from uh, the topology of mini batches without, without going, um, going too crazy. And um, interestingly, this is not on the slide now, I mean, I can we send those reference around later though? There is great work by Alcan Sol Solomon and colleagues now who were looking at, at this point here, so at this subsample point, in much more detail. And they were able to show that you can even reconstruct your original metric space under certain conditions if you have sufficiently many subsamples uh, in, in terms of persistent fragments. That is really a mind blowing result to me still because we. When we teach TDA, or when, even when we, when we do TDA, we often tend to think about this as being a very lossy uh, a compression that is happening here. So we take our data, we put it through the grinder, and then we, we, we really don't know what is left of the original data structure. But I was really astounded to see that it turns out that if you, if you do this in a, in a, in a very nice structured uh, way, then you can actually reconstruct at least some certain properties. So just want to mention this, it has nothing to do with the autoencoders here, but it is helpful to know and I think it points towards the general utility of these techniques. Now, um, before showing uh, some point points finally, I want to give you a brief intuition of how this how our gradient calculation works in these models. So basically all the machine learning has to, has to be done by, by doing some differential analysis of course. So how can we actually uh, do this gradient calculation in practice? Now, the thing is that if we assume that our data set is in general position, that we have uh, unique distances always, then we can map uh, all, the, all the distances in this matrix from the individual first construction. We can map all the points in the diagram on the right hand side to exactly one, or in this case two, but it's a distance matrix, so it's metric, uh, to one distance in the distance matrix of the original data. And this entry being a distance, this means that it depends on two points, and it depends on two points in a continuous fashion because we can change these points' positions, and this will mean that the distance um, and the, the point positions in the diagram will also change. And as long as we assume that none of these points here on the right-hand side collapse on each other, so if we assume that all the points in the diagram are also at distinct positions, then we can always find a neighborhood in our and uh, during our optimization procedure in which this diagram mapping remains constant and that means that we can by the gradient rule just pull out the persistent homology calculation and directly uh, get a gradient to our input data. And that is really, <laughs> I, I think this is truly really great result. Others have also derived this with, uh, in, 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 other, uh, in other ways, um, but this really makes it possible to do actually this, this, this whole optimization here. Um, now, um, Still wondering when the point loss will come. Maybe I forgot to put this slide in. If so, then I'm really sorry, but it should come now. Um, the, the loss term that we, that we get from our calculation, I don't want to spend too much time here for the details, but it really boils down towards some kind of pseudo-metric. So we take a look at the, the loss of features when we go from the persistence diagram uh, in the original space to the persistence diagram in the latent space, and then we have another term which just flips that around. Basically, it's, it's bi-directional because we want to make sure that we, that we match both options nicely. Um, a question that always arises here is whether this is actually a metric, but I already said that no, no, it's not a metric, uh, it's a pseudo-metric. This also maybe points towards a more general concept in machine learning. You often don't need the full precision of that. I, I mean, it would be nice to have, to have a metric. You can certainly put a metric in there if you want to, but then this gets even harder to, to optimize in practice because um, it is a little bit, um, yeah, it's a little bit harder to calculate. And whereas this is just essentially some kind of including distance calculation with, with added thrills and frills, but for a bottleneck distance calculation, for instance, you would have to solve an optimal transfer. Now, now, finally, the slide I was waiting for comes, so let me just briefly illustrate what the, what the differences are. So these are various ways of reducing the dimensionality of your data, uh, we created a very nice thing, well, we have other examples, of course, in the paper, I should stress that, but this is the nicest one to explain uh, to, to, uh, to others about. Um, it's a data set that consists of a large sphere in a high dimensional space, and inside the sphere you have a lot of other smaller spheres that are being nested, and a lot of um, lower dimensional spheres that are being nested. So what you want to see ideally, or at least is our claim, you want to see this large scale sphere, spherical structure, and then the small spheres within. 
And without, well, I mean, it was a data set that was created specifically to showcase the issues with existing algorithms, but you can see that only the topological model over here shows you these small blobs. Uh, and indeed, it's, it's by design that these blobs are really, really small because the, the big sphere is so large that the smaller spheres also have fewer points by comparison. So ideally, you want to see that there are some scale differences in the data. Whereas if you take a look at the other um, uh, algorithms for dimensionality reduction, they all represent certain aspects of the data correctly, but certain other aspects they cannot represent. So for instance, the nice TZ or TSME, but I pronounce it how it's pronounced it from my bi biological collaborators. So this one just pulls apart the big sphere and just shows you the smaller spheres here. Um, UMAP tries to go for a kind of compromise route. Um, UMAP, by the way, another side note, is a great algorithm that is based on, on some, some category theory approaches, but it's so great that no one actually knows how it works in practice, so it's still, still everyone uses it in practice, and again, this is recorded, and Korea, I think that's good. Um, no, it's a great algorithm, but it's, it's, it's relatively hard to explain to people that are not uh, part of the inner circle of, of, um, of people that, that have that knowledge already. So, whereas PCA is rather easy to explain to everyone that understands a little bit of eigen systems and eigen composition. Um, anyway, uh, that's that. So you can see that this kind of works. We also have tons of other evaluations and experiments. This was a, a nightmare to write and evaluate as a paper, but essentially what we found is that A, our topological autoencoder doesn't destroy the reconstruction quality of the, of the autoencoder. That's good. So basically you don't pay a hefty price for adding topology to the mix. Um, and what we also found is that the latent spaces that we get out of there are typically much better in terms of preserving certain uh, certain features um, of the data. All right. Now, um, are, there, are there any questions about this first part? I'm seeing from the time that I might uh, I might want to want to speed up a little bit, but um, I think we're we're, we're going to be fine. So, any questions about the audio so far? Yeah. So you optimize only on the topological loss. Yes, so, so we, we, we can, that's a very good point. So the question is whether we apply this only on the topological loss. Indeed, um, our, um, the, the, the paper is in, in a misnomer in so far as we don't present a specific autoencoder structure, but we just show that you can apply <coughs> our topological loss term to any architecture. And again, we have, if you look at the appendix, it's one of those papers where the appendix is longer than the original paper because we did so many additional experiments to make everyone happy, including myself, but also the reviewers. Um, and we show that we can add this to variational autoencoders, for instance. We even have, and I, 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 the, the, the older I get, the, the prouder of that I am, um, we even have a topology-based PCA version. So that's, that's really cool. So they, Take PCA and you just add the topology stuff there as well. So it, it is indeed a very generic uh, concept that you that you can apply to your data. Any, any other questions? Yeah. If you construct our topology loss with our industrial construction, you should always similar to the properties than the starting set. No. Then why do you compare the topological properties of the latent space with the starting space instead of the reconstruction, reconstruction space? Ah, yeah. Questions about whether we compare, um, uh, why we compare the, the reconstruct, why we don't compare the reconstructed space with the uh, with the starting space in terms of topology. That's a very good question. We could also do that. Actually, it, it would be very useful to do that, and it would probably result in different um, in different reconstructions. Uh, but we wanted to specifically t uh, tackle the fact where people use the later representation for deriving some kind of knowledge of the data, where people actually put it bluntly, where they look at the later representation and say, ah, this is what that means. So there we were saying, okay, it's at least important to keep track of cycles and, for instance, connected components in, in that data as much as that matches the original, the original data. But you're right, we could also add it, add it in the reconstruction space. I think what we found is that Adding it to the reconstructed space does not necessarily lead to better label spaces in the in the middle. So it, it, it didn't solve our our original problem where we said, okay, then we still can't trust very big airports here. We still can't trust the label space. Does, does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Of course. What? Oh, any other questions? Yeah. Um, so how much uh, did the interpretability of the label space uh, after this analysis? Mm -hmm. How how is this even um, or how did you measure the 
Yeah, so how do we measure the interpretability or the improvements of the data space? Yeah, it's also a very good question. So we have, um, we, um, in the absence of having the real ground truth information, I mean, we, we only had ground truth information for the spheres data set, where we knew what, what would be going on and, and how that would look. But um, in the absence of that, we um, um, compared essentially density distribution. So we measured the density of the original data and the density of the of the embeddings and tried to try to match those. And we had a couple of other measures from the nationality reduction theory where people were looking at, for instance, how much do the neighborhoods change of points and so on. And we found improvements in, in almost all of these of these metrics. But in general, it would be much, much easier if we had a data set where one kind of knows what what, what should be shown in the latent space, right? So this, this is always the problem. But, but we try to, to do broad measuring of, of results that, that show that this improves. Any other questions? All right, and let me move on to the second part. And again, uh, speeding up a little bit here, but that's, I, I, think, I think this will work fine. So um, I want to talk a little bit about graph representation learning now. Uh, so graphs are, of course, much easier in a sense than a metric space because we already get the connectivity, right? So we don't have to do the virtual trips construction. Um, but zooming out a little bit, uh, in machine learning, or in general, when you want to do something with graphs, you have uh, fundamental issues and, and uh, obstacles that come with graph representations. Namely, um, you know, of course, that two graphs can easily have different number of vertices. So if you want to reason about two graphs being similar or dissimilar, things like this, you typically want a type of vectorized representation, so that takes all the graphs that you can think about and it maps them into a nice space, and then you com can compare the graphs in these space instead of comparing them with each other. Um, this representation also needs to be permutation invariant, so this is something that you will hear quite often when you stumble over, over graph learning literature, because permutation invariant here means that you don't want the ordering in which you give the you nodes, know, you don't want this to, to uh, interfere with the the output because the graph has no inherent problem, right? So, and there's a couple of approaches that, that have been done in the literature. There's uh, these shallow approaches which are based on encoder decoders or graph or something like this. And there's a lot of deep approaches that recently cropped up, like graph convolution networks, graph isomorphism networks, graph attention networks, and so on. All of those um, are based on one nice paradigm. There are now other paradigms emerging as well, but this is, I think, the most prevalent one at the, at the moment. Uh, it is the paradigm of message passing. So message passing means that you take your graph and neighboring nodes can exchange messages, whatever those might be. So typically, it's, you, you have some high dimension information at every node, and you just uh, um, exchange information about um, what, is, uh, what is going on in these nodes. Um, you can iterate this process, for instance. So even if you only ever talk to your neighbors, you get some information from your first order neighbors, but they got information from their first order neighbors, and then if you iterate this process constantly, uh, you will get information about your, your whole graph. The interesting thing about this approach, and just briefly illustrate this, you start with the central node here, and you take a look at these neighbors, and then you start aggregating uh, information from these neighbors, for instance, using a sum or a mean of these attributes that they already have stored there. The, the advantage of this paradigm is that all the operations that you have, they remain fundamentally local. So you only ever need to look at your own neighborhood. You only require some form of activation or aggregation function, which should be more precise here. And you can easily combine the resulting representations. So this paradigm is so successful that indeed now people, and this has been a while ago now in machine learning terms, people start even uh, writing a kind of taxonomy that encompasses all of the graph networks that you can think about. And there's um, basically three functions that you will find time and time again. Uh, an aggregation function which takes the individual node attributes from the neighbors, a combine function which <coughs> combines them in, uh, in, some, in some form of fashion. So for instance, this can be just um, an extension in terms of a vector space, for instance, and a readout function which takes all the learned features of your graph and provides you with one representation of the, of the individual graphs. Um, so this has been going on for a while now, and I would say virtually all the graph or networks that you will find today fit somehow into this process in one way or the other. Um, as an example, um, there are graph convolutional networks. I don't want to specifically 
match out why, why this is why this is different architecture than others. But in graph convolution networks, you have a combined function that is directly integrated into an aggregation function, and you can represent the full network or the learning process as this very nice um, matrix formulation where you have a nonlinear function sigma that you apply to this um, augmented adjacency matrix decomposition. Um, and this is really nice because it gives you a way to take graphs of different sizes, with different nodes with different edges and so on, and learn one representation that you can use for uh, classification or for regression task and so on and so forth. Um, there's a couple of issues in this space. Um, I'm going to name a few of them um, as we move through that. So I want to briefly present what topology can do in this case. And this is also um, a work from, uh, from last year. Uh, on the topological layer for graph classification, or rather we call it topological graph neural networks because we show how to enhance and imbue every <coughs> network with topological information. It's joint work with Max, Edward, Michael, and Eve and Karsten as well. Um, the motivation for this was, was super simple in this case because believe it or not, but, um, no one actually looked at the topology, even though they were they were working with graphs. I find this astounding, and this is really this was really weird in some sense. And indeed, it turns out that although graphs are topological objects, uh, most of the graph networks that you have they are incapable of recognizing certain topological structures. Um, I mean, truth be told, this is changing now. So we we're seeing more and more architectures that are more powerful and that can recognize, for instance, circles of arbitrary length in your data. But at the time when we were writing this, this was really like a, a no man's land, and no one, um, no one was um, was working um, very well um, about addressing uh, these types of oversight. So one of our challenges was um, what can we actually gain when we view a graph neural network with knowledge about the topology of the graph. Um, and to do this, we were again taking some motivation from, uh, from the persistent homology calculation, of course. So we already know that we can get multi-scale topological features from the graph using the filtration. But we know that we can use persistence diagrams as topological descriptors. And now we, we have two questions to overcome, namely, how do we obtain good filtration? So good meaning filtrations that are helpful for a certain task with the graph. And the other is, how can we use these persistence diagrams in a differential setting. Um, and now we have to brace ourselves quickly because a very ugly diagram will come. Here it is. Um, I won't have time to explain all the examples here, but uh, essentially let me summarize what we did. So we um, started with a graph. At this graph, we have some node attributes that live in some kind of uh, two dimensional space. So typically, this can be, for instance, um, information about um, if you have a molecule, it can be information about the atoms of the molecule. So what is the atomic mass and what are the bonds and so on. We then have a function phi that we call the node map. And this node map learns uh, k different filtrations of the graph. So we just learn this function and apply it to create k different filtrations of the graph. Um, these can be um, very different filtrations. They can also be the same filtrations. We, this is kind of the, the random or the stochasticity of the neural network that we use here for our advantage. And Following this, we use a coordinatization function psi to take the persistence diagrams that we get out of there and put them again in a very nice vector space that we can use um, for the training process. So essentially, you have to think about this uh, about topology-based graph neural networks as a concatenation of two functions: one, learning this filtration, then doing a persistence calculation, getting the persistence diagrams, and then subsequently using these coordinate functions psi to embed the persistence diagrams in a very nice space. Um, and then uh, uh, taking the, the learned features to assign them to the original uh, to the original graph again. And then the process can start again and again. Um, so uh, without adding too many details, we realize most of these functions using a neural network representation, so that's, that's a very nice way of of doing this because everything is differential anyways. Um, if you uh, if you want to take a look at some previous work, the slides will be sent around as work with uh, Christoph Hofer and um, Roland Quitt on graph filtration learning. So we already know how to learn a single filtration for a graph, but in this case, um, we learn multiple filtrations of the graph. Um, this 
topology based graph networks turned out to be actually very useful in, in solving certain tasks, but there is a slight twist on that. So we were actually <coughs> able to show that technically we uh, knew that that is our method, so topological graph, uh, the topological graph layer, which we call toggle, and persistent homology, we were able to show that it's actually more expressive than the prevalent um, test for graph isomorphism that is used to determine the expressivity of graph neural networks. Um, so we were able to show that there are graphs that we can only distinguish with persistent homology, but not with this other test. Um, so you would think that this translates to very good empirical performance, but unfortunately, this is actually not the case. So when we ran our experiments, we took an existing <laughs> we took the exist we took an existing graph neural network architecture. We replaced one layer by our topological graph layer, and then we measured the predictive performance. The idea behind this is maybe more relevant now for the machine learning. But uh, the idea was that we make sure that our um, the number of parameters that we have is approximately the same because otherwise you very easily get into unfair comparisons where you have one model that has thousands of parameters and the other model has millions of parameters and then you're saying, oh, the ones with millions of parameters can learn the task better. I mean, this is not surprising because we have more options to uh, to optimize, right? But just to, to show this, so we, um, we were aware of this issue, we tried to put this together. Um, we used some synthetic data sets which are relatively easy to, ca to classify using uh, topology. So um, if I give you the cycles data set, so it's either one big cycle or a couple of smaller cycles, then you just need to take a look at the Betty numbers to tell me which one is which, right? Because one has either, um, if there's one cycle, then the Betty number of one, and if there's multiple cycles, the Betty number is different. Um, we similarly also have necklaces data set uh, where we either have this nice circular structure in the middle or the smaller circles um, on the sides. Um, what we found is that our method works uh, pretty well in these cases. So we can take a normal uh, graph neural network <coughs> architecture, we can swap out one layer for the topology-based graph layer, and uh, we almost always get, uh, get perfect uh, performance, perfect classification performance. I mean, that's nice, but it's also not very surprising. But the surprise started to happen, and this is also where then we'll come to the end. The surprises started happening when we looked at more complicated data sets coming from molecular data analysis, for instance. So um, here it turned out for us that the data sets that we have available for graph neural network analysis, they tend to leak information into the known attributes. So it turns out that if you just use the known attributes, if you just use things like the availability of, of di uh, double or triple bounds, uh, the atomic mass, and so on and so forth, you're already pretty good at classifying the graph itself. So in, in a nutshell, you don't need the graph to classify the graph, which is weird, right? Uh, so we found that this, that this prevents topological features from being useful. So what we did is we just changed those data sets and removed all the node features and just focused on the structural information, on the topological information alone. And then we compared the performance um, of, of a non-topology-based model with a topology-based model. We found that this works pretty spectacularly well, I would say, um, depending on the data set, of course. So that's a win, but if we put back the node information, then unfortunately we find that the best performance is not driven by the availability of topological structures. So we still find that overall if we add topology to a given graph neural network, its performance goes up, but there are graph neural networks that already reach the best performance without the availability of topology. Um, and this is a very sober message to end on, unfortunately, but it, it is a very important message because um, so uh, Mikael Bader or Johansson summarized this pretty perfectly. Uh, he gave this a twist. He said that if all you have is nails, then everything looks like a hammer. So this is not the way this is usually said, but he's exactly right. So this is this is the, the saying with a twist. This means that the data sets that we that we looked at for the graph neural networks, they actually don't necessarily require any knowledge about the topology, which is, again, super weird and mind-blowing to me because it's a graph, so of course you need to know something about this topology to classify it. But it turns out that all the information that you need to classify is more or less already prevalent and existing in the known attributes. And this is a problem because it might mean that essentially the field of graph learning itself 
might actually move in the wrong direction, might actually optimize in the wrong direction because it looks at the wrong data sets to, to create new models, to create new architectures. So these data sets may actually stymie in some sense the, the progress that we're doing. That means so clearly it's, um, and I'm already working on this, so it's not, it's not a hollow uh, promise, I hope, but we clearly need other data sets. We clearly need better data sets that are a little bit more aligned with the, with the topology, for instance, or with the, with the real graph features. Um, because nevertheless, there is work that shows that for certain data sets, for certain tasks, the high order structures such as cliques in the graph are actually crucial in discerning between different graphs. And uh, this gives me some hope that, uh, that we can also overcome this issue. Um, now, as the last question, I always put this here because I'm really interested in this. Still haven't found a way to do this. I would love to learn sparse filtrations, so filtrations that don't make use of all the parts of the graph. Um, and, and, and somehow compactify the graph even further. We'd love to do this. Um, I post this as an open question because I really don't know um, how to do it. Um, as a last, last, last point, um, I want to point out um, our framework, Python Topological. If you want to play with machine learning and topology, so it's basically a nice wrapper uh, uh, around certain other frameworks that already exist that makes it possible to throw this a little bit in your machine learning pipeline. Um, I'm always looking for additional contributors. Give me me a call if you're interested in this. Um, we want to showcase that we, that we can bridge uh, machine learning and topology a little bit uh, more. With that, I'm at the end. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and happy to take additional questions now.